And now the winner of the 2013 Caldecott Medal for the most distinguished picture book for children is John Clausen for This Is Not My Hat. Published by Candlewick Press. Designed by Ann Stott. Edited by Liz Bicknell. In this darkly humorous tale, a tiny fish knows it's wrong to steal a hat. It fits him just right. But the big fish wants his hat back. John Clausen's controlled palette, opposing narratives, and subtle cues compel readers to follow the fish and imagine the consequence. Illustrations rendered digitally and in Chinese ink propel us through a story filled with thievery, bravado, confession, and betrayal. <laughs> a matte black ocean and a murky sea bottom hint at the dark tale to come. Clausen's choices of trim size, layout, and composition lay the foundation for this book's collective unity of story and theme and sets an appropriately suspenseful pace. Through restrained artic artistic touches, a lifted pupil, a slight displacement of seagrass, an exhalation of bubbles, Clausen's masterful illustrations tell the story the narrator doesn't know, but that the child reader can figure out. Clausen's art respects a child's intellect and invites the child reader to become a part of the story. John Clausen, it is my great honor, on behalf of the 2013 Caldecott Committee, to acknowledge your excellence in artistic achievement and to present to you the Caldecott, Randolph Caldecott Medal for This Is Not My Hat. Gotta bring the whiskey up for that one. <laughs> I've been thinking about the logistics of my hat brim versus the lights in my face and everything. I'm gonna take the chance because I promised to wear it. <laughs> oh boy, here we go. <laughs> A lot of good creative work is achieved by avoiding the things you know you can't do, as it is by doing the things you know you can. Choosing picture book illustration as a job was, I assumed, a great way to avoid doing the things I don't feel especially strong in. It's a long and varied list, but somewhere near the top of it are fielding compliments and public speaking. <laughs> Giving a speech to everyone I work with and admire under the context of the biggest professional compliment I could ever hope to get is kind of a perfect storm of things I set my life up trying to avoid. <laughs> but since we are all trapped in this room, I'll get right to it. I'd like to start with my thank yous, since leaving it to the end sometimes killed momentum, and also I feel like I'll be more at risk by crying then. I've been asked a few times since this award was announced about whether or not I have under my, now that I have this award under my belt, if I'd be able to tackle any dream book projects I had that I might not have been as viable before. But I have a publisher who let me make two of my dream projects already. Candlewick Press has been everything a boy could ever dream of. My editor Liz was sent, I believe, from another planet to guide me and show me how to start a book, work through a book, sharpen a book, and then sharpen it again. I owe her more than I'll ever figure out, I think. And my art director, I think, arrived in the same spaceship with Liz. <laughs> she is exacting and careful and tasteful and gentle. And as much as I worry about the story and the writing, I'll know I'll never worry about the book being a beautiful object because of her. My support team at Candlewick was, has been a fierce, formidable team, and I'm so glad not to be on the wrong side of them. Sharon and Jenny and John and Karen and Elise and Jennifer and Laura and everybody there are a tireless and powerful group and it has always felt like I am truly loved. My agent Steve who has changed my life completely. I never had an older brother and I'm gonna cry. <laughs> but I don't suspect the feeling is far off. I don't know how I start anything anymore without calling you first. And I feel like this time how lucky I am to have found you. I'd also like to thank Mac 
I hear all the time these days about a new crop of picture book makers who are doing great work, <laughs> but nobody knows that all of them are calling Mac, all of them, ten times a day. <laughs> he is the godfather of all of us. I'm so happy this job has brought me one of my great friendships. I'd also feel off if I didn't thank Lucy, who gave me my very first picture job, picture book job, I'm sorry. I feel like I'm in a room with family tonight, but it's easy to forget when bookmaking was sacred and a mysterious place that nobody knew how to get into, and she was the first one to show me inside. My actual family is here tonight, my parents, who are so deeply and blindly proud of all their boys. <laughs> You've probably all met my parents by now. <laughs> I want so much to fool you into thinking this is just how work is every day for me. <laughs> and my wife, Moran, who holds me all night while I mutter nonsensical things about motivations of turtles and crabs. <laughs> I think we have to plug in the ballroom. <laughs> Where was I? I will thank the committee, of course, but that's kind of what the whole rest of the speech is about. When they called me, when the committee called me to tell me that I'd won this award, I was just putting the phone down after getting a call from a cab driver who was waiting downstairs to take me to an airport to catch an early flight. I don't remember what I said to the committee, and I remember even less about what I said when they called again three minutes later to tell me about the honor for extra yarn. <laughs> There's two phone calls, you jerks. <laughs> they were laughing a lot, they were laughing a lot. The cab could have dropped me off in the LA River after that and I wouldn't have noticed. But I felt bad later sitting on the plane thinking I've sort of botched my reaction and hoping I came off as surprised and excited and stunned as I really was. I think I was just like, yeah, that's great. <laughs> As foggy as my memory is about what I said to them, I have a strangely clear record of my internal reaction, especially to the first phone call about the fish book. I'd like to break it down in stages here, partly to give the committee my proper thanks, and partly because I think it goes some distance in explaining how I feel about making picture books in general. My internal reaction when they were telling me that they decided to give This Is Not My Hat Caldecott Medal can be divided into three distinct phases. If you were to give the titles to these phases, the first phase could be called They Had Been Looking at the Book, <clears throat> they had been looking at the book. I don't know if I ever get used to the idea that all the copies of any book that I write and illustrate myself are in my own house. <laughs> I get a box of them around publication time and I think, well great, here are the books. These are the books. <laughs> and I put them on a shelf and I glance over at them whenever I walk through the room. And if someone comes over and they see the books and they like the book, I give them a book and that's one of the books and then that's, that's how it goes. And then later I'm in a library or a bookstore and I see a copy of the book, or maybe more copies of the book, and it's like seeing a picture of my family in a frame on a store shelf. I think, that's not supposed to be outside. <laughs> and you glance around wildly to see if everyone around you, then you know that they're all devoting their entire mind to all the mistakes that are just on the cover. The only way out of this kind of anxiety, now that the book is apparently out in the wild, is to convince yourself, for the moment, that regular people don't concern themselves as much with all the details that might be wrong in these books. It's not that they are incapable of seeing them, but we see so many things all day, we don't have time to pick apart everything we don't like. This argument holds, barely, and it's just enough to get, stop the impulse to grab all the copies of the book and sprint out the door. <laughs> but the realization that the Caldecott Committee has had your book amongst them is something this argument has no power against. They are a group of beings assembled entirely to notice things. <laughs> here is what the Caldecott Committee looks like. They're very sweet, you can see them here, but this isn't them. <laughs> there is a dark stone room, probably underground. It has only one source of light, a hole in the stone ceiling engineered using long forgotten mathematics that lets in a single round shaft of light. That shaft of light comes down and rests on a huge wooden table, and at the center of the table is a book that a group of cloaked and hooded figures are murmuring about <laughs> in a language reserved only for these proceedings. Their glowing eyes under their hoods scan the pages and widen at things they don't like, and they let out soothing sighs for things they do like. At one point or another, weeks or months ago, 
well, months ago now, I'm sure, I was sitting somewhere eating a burrito or something while this huddled and sacred ceremony was being applied to my book, and I didn't know it. What did they talk about? What did they see? In the bedroom where I was taking this phone call from the committee, there was actually a copy of the book sitting on a pile of stuff, and I glanced over at it accusingly, thinking, you didn't tell me any of this happened. <laughs> The cover looked back at me, the lettering of the title, and my name under the title, and a little fish. Making that cover had scared the crap out of me. Interior illustrations are one thing, but covers fall squarely under the heading of graphic design. I love doing covers and lettering, but there's so much formality that can be applied to these things. There are people who spend their whole lives on lettering and the rules that make it work, and here I am drawing my own letters like a jerk. Who knows what rules of kerning and line with I am running off the road with my shenanigans. And none of these worries about the type go anywhere near the worries about the placement of that fish. I once bought a book on grid systems as they can be applied to page layout. One side of the book was in English and the other was of course in German. <laughs> it was a beautiful book and absolutely impenetrable. When the time came to design this is not my hat's cover, there was no grid to decide the placement of a little fish in his sea of negative space. There was only one or two or three afternoons of blunt nudging and grunting and nudging some more, and then having lunch and coming back and nudging again. Surely these mal magical Caldecott committee creatures had held the cover containing the little fish against all of these ancient grids to find his placement violated all of the morality the golden section carries with it. <laughs> their glowing eyes widening to their widenest, glowingest size. <laughs> you all look very nice tonight. <laughs> They had been looking at the book. Jeez. You don't really come to terms for that so much as you decide not to think about it anymore. And so when you finally decide not to think about it anymore, you move on to the next phase. And you think that after they had been looking at the book, had run its unknowable and terrible course, the next logical step would be they liked the book. But that would be running too far ahead. That is the last step. There is a step in between before I allow myself that level of back padding and it can be called the book makes sense. The book makes sense. That's a big deal. The idea for the structure of This Is Not My Hat owes quite a bit to a little known story called The Telltale Heart by an author I think is showing a lot of promise named Menger Allan Poe. <laughs> <laughs> he might be here tonight someday, you never know. <laughs> in his story, we have a narrator talking to us in the first person about something he did that was wrong. He is given the whole floor, without narrative interruption, to try and make an argument for his reasonableness and sanity by telling us his version of how things went down. Not only is this the same setup as This Is Not My Hat, but I think it is also very close to what it feels like for anybody to do any kind of creative work at all, because they both involve so much hope. Storytelling in any form is an essentially hopeful thing to do. I don't mean anything as ambitious as hoping you can change your audience or even educate them in any broad sense but just in the fact that you, as a storyteller, are hoping that your mind and the minds of your audience are close enough that you can know that what they need to hear in order to follow along with your story. When I'm asked what I hope people get out of my work, I always feel it's kind of a backwards question. I never really know what to say because the real question should be, what do I hope I get out of my work? And, there, and the answer to that is simply that I want to check with everybody else that I'm still okay. There's a spread early on in the book where the little fish is describing to us what he's going, that he's going to try and hide after having stolen the hat. He's describing where, he's, where the plants grow big and tall and close together. In the first few drafts, this spread was filled with an illustration of the plants he was talking about. It had already been established that the narration was being used as sort of a voiceover to what we were seeing, accurate or not, and that the little fish didn't need to be on the page for us to know he was talking. I thought, that, I thought that the synthesis had been established, it would be okay to show these plants, even though he hadn't reached them yet. The idea being that when he did get there, there would be no confusion that he had made it to his destination. I thought it was a really cool idea, and I love the spread, but people who saw the roughs kept reading the page as if it were in real time, as if the fish had already gone behind the plants and was talking to us from there. I was so sad and confused that my thinking wasn't lining up with everybody else's. It stayed like this for weeks until I was finally showing it to somebody new, and as I turned the page to the plant spread, I saw it. I saw that it did in fact read that he was going behind the plants already. And I was so relieved. I didn't have a solution yet, but the problem was real to me. I didn't have to pretend to understand it, and I knew what everyone was talking about. As an aside, the solution that involved putting the plants on the end papers instead is my favorite idea in the book. 
and I'll always be a little bit jealous of my editor, Liz, for thinking of it. <laughs> the first time you show anything you came up with by yourself to anybody else, you feel the same kind of feel, fear you feel for the narrator in the telltale heart, or the little fish in This Is Not My Hat, who has every hope that he is talking to like-minded people who will understand his actions as soon as he gets a chance to explain. What makes both characters sort of doomed from the outset is that even though they, what they're saying makes sense to them, they've actually drifted off into a place that where we as an audience can't back them up anymore. Putting out a creative piece of work is sort of like an experiment, like the one sailors might have done to navigate in olden times. When you're done telling your story, you can look at whomever you're telling to and ask, do you get it? And every yes you get is like a shining point of reference, twinkling in the sky to navigate by. And there's no feeling like having, oh man, I need some whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> and there's no feeling like having the sky fill up with those points. I'm still okay. The book makes sense. The third thing you ask, or at least after this, you know, this whole business of making sure you're okay is done with, you can ask them, do you like it? But I'm beginning to learn that the more you do creative work, the less you ask this question. It's not that you don't care about the answer. You care very much. But I think you begin to realize that you can't own the answer either way. It's not really your question to ask. Your job and the things you, take, you can take credit for end largely at the previous stage where the book makes the most sense that it can. This is assuming, I, I guess, that you yourself like it. And I've had the huge luck to be given the position where I can take the time to make sure that I do like the things I make. And I do like them. These books are my little guys. But that doesn't mean everyone else has to like them. One of the things in the book that is still kind of a mystery to me is the crab. <laughs> the crab's purpose in the story was not to change or advance the plot. I think the big fish probably would have found the little fish anyway, without the crab betraying what he knew. I put the crab in initially because I felt like it was too sad that nobody else in the story knew what had happened. But the crab isn't simply an observer. He's done something wrong. He's at the risk of drifting off into the same place the little fish already is, where we can't connect with him anymore. But the crab is given a spot in the second to last page where we see him again, watching the big fish swim back home. And we get to see him think about what he did. And I think we get a moment to forgive him. Not because he deserves it, but because we can relate to him. And that, I think, is what makes the book work. An audience can take in the information they've given and understand the events and what the characters do. This understanding, them getting the story, and by extension telling you that you're OK, feels like a kind of grace. It's something you've asked your audience for and been mercifully granted. But when it goes further than that, and when they think it's a good book, and they tell you so, and it comes as something as a next step to being declared OK, something extra that nobody really deserves, and I suspect very few people get, and feels like a kind of forgiveness. And that's what that last phase felt like and still feels like. They were looking at the book, but the book makes sense, and they liked the book. My little guy. I can't thank the committee enough for this honor, or all of you, for your encouragement and enthusiasm. I feel so lucky. Thank you very much. <laughs>